Welcome to the journey of an esthete, a comprehensive examination of all things aesthetic, the arts, the humanities, and what it means to be human. Jim McCoy. Hello. Jim McCoy, hey, this is hey, uh how, how are you are doing? You? This is uh Mitch Hampton and you're on Journey of an Esthete podcast today. Hello, Mitch. I hope you're well today. You too. It's a it's an unusual time, as we all know. And I'm I'm gonna just say a, a couple of remarks in front, if you don't mind, before we delve into sure. the, the discussion. I there are people on my show they run a real gamut. There are people on my show who I, who I've I've never met. So, you know, I, I just know accomplishments that, they, that they've that they made or done, you know, whether it's a, a book or a movie, but I don't really know them personally. And then there are some guests on my show who I do know personally. And you are in the latter category, I believe, right? Because, um, right? I, uh, it, I am, and yeah. I'm uh, glad and honored to be so. Yeah, so um, I guess I know you from having moved to North Carolina and living in Weaverville. And I suppose I could start off by saying that you were for a long time a preacher here. Is that correct? That's correct. We moved, uh, my family and I moved here in um, October of 1997. And I was pastor of First Baptist Church First in Baptist? until. That's right. Uh-huh. And that's yeah, right around. Until, uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that's right on Main Street, which isn't too far from where I live, right? It's about a, a mile away, right? Wouldn't you say? Or? That's right. Yes. Yeah. So. It's a beautiful town. It's all the main street walk, the, uh, the uh, restaurants and the shops and the churches. And it's uh, we we again, knew of the of uh, the town before we moved here. And uh, we're so uh, glad to be able to spend, well, the last 23 years here. I retired as pastor there in uh, 2000, May of 2017, but my wife has continued to um, work uh, with music, uh, the the minister of music there. So she still well, I know, remains there. Absolutely. I mean, I know that you both you and your wife are musical. Uh, you, you, I know that your wife teaches music and teaches piano and does choir and a whole, whole bunch of things. I've heard you yourself sing country songs or protest songs. That were that were done in the seventies in the Nixon era. I heard you sing that over here, and I know that your daughter is a very a kind of a famous rock musician and has a, has a band, right? So that's right. There's a lot. One of them. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. But you know, generally on my show, I like to do what I call a linear chronology, which I guess is a fancy way of saying the bio of a person. So if you don't mind going back into the sixties, seventies. You know how you came to have the beliefs that you have have now, uh, in your growth in terms of your of your faith and practice and all the rest of it. I should add that you're currently um, involved in in ministering in a prison. Is that correct? A correctional facility. That's correct. Yes, Craggy Prison is a, uh, a unit of the uh, of a state prison uh, in North Carolina, and it's in Asheville. Mm-hmm. And there is a minimum unit, which is an honor grade, which is about 180 offenders there, and then a medium unit, which is the razor wire and the right. armed guards in the towers, and that's there's about 300 there. So um, it's it, with COVID, it has, um, again, drastically affected uh, our normal, the normal uh, schedule there, but I'm, I'm at the the, the prison, actually both units, uh, Thursdays and Fridays. So, um, and I've been there since, uh, is it in the chaplain or volunteer kind of setting, uh, really for, for the 20 something years we've been here, but as a chaplain, the last two and a half. That's, that's really remarkable to do that work to do that. And you, so you have been there for quite a long time, almost as long as I guess, as you, you were a pastor at first Baptist, 
But I guess, I, you know, again, in the spirit of the linear chronology, if you don't mind going back in time and talking about, you know, your, your origins and, and, and schooling or, or, or your, the first sermon you gave and where that was or anything that comes to mind or just where you went, where you went to school, because I know that's very important to you. You went to some pretty, you had some people that were mentors and that influenced you. And so you might want to talk about some of that. That would be great. Okay. Yes. Well, stop me when I wander. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was born. I'm um, coming up on, uh, or my next birthday will be by three score in 10 years. So I, I was born in 50, 1951. So, wow. And uh, life revolved around a little church there in rural Rowan County. And um, I guess, well, I don't want to jump. Yeah, I want to stay linear here, but uh, just oh, I, let me let me. A I'm sorry, let me. Months ago. Okay, let me interject a point. You, you know, part of the linear progression, I should add, is to be nonlinear. So things will come up that are out of sequence, and that's okay. Just go with it. So go ahead, whatever comes to comes to mind. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, yeah. In, t- in terms of the esthete and the music part, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, again, it was a small Baptist congregation, and uh, the. Um, I guess in terms of category, it'd be low church hymns, huh. but uh, they were instilled so deeply, and I discovered how deeply just in the last couple of months, uh, sitting by my mother's deathbed for about, um, gosh, three three months. I guess she was diagnosed uh, or, or put in uh, imminent status with hospice, and it was about three months. Um, mm-hmm. and sitting by, and she was a musician. She was a the church pianist and organist. And, uh, for her years, she was 99, uh, when she mm-hmm. died on April the 7th, this past. And, uh, mm-hmm. so yeah, I was just, um, awed by how deeply those old hymns of, of singing them, uh, from memory, um, and, uh, yeah, just that was, uh, and a lady by the name of Fanny Crosby. I don't know that some listeners may recognize that name. Most would not, but a lady who lived about a hundred years. She was born a hundred years before mother, and uh, wow. she's uh, in New York. Uh, was blinded by uh, a physician's um, carelessness, actually putting a poultice on her eye for eyes for a minor eye infection and he left it too long and blinded her at a young age but so she was able to not be bittered embittered in life and so composed the the the, uh, lyrics for thousands of hymns and so it was uh um yeah singing may may i ask you a, a, a technical question about her doing having done that when you say composed lyrics, was she putting new lyrics to older established hymns, or writing? No, she was brand new. writing poems essentially. Oh, okay. Uh, and then other uh, musicians uh, set her poems, her lyrics uh, to music, and uh, and they've become you know, a massive amount of her. Uh, the verses that she composed uh, have become a part of the hymnody. Oh wow! Uh, and so, especially the last, the last verses of uh, a lot of hymns are, you know, of a crossing over, uh, and so sitting with your mother, and sometimes she would be singing or smiling, sometimes just lying there with her eyes closed, but sing. I mean, this is not a Fanny Crosby hymn, but like, uh, soon we'll reach the shining river, soon our pilgrimage will cease. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. And, uh, wow. yeah, to sing those kind of songs, uh, there are depths of love. This is Fanny Crosby. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. So all mm-hmm. these, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't want to. Uh, uh, well, no. well, anyway. That, well, that, that's, that's very, uh, that, that's very. Mind. That's very important that you launched into that because uh, and started uh, started reciting um, very elo- eloquently the, the, those words. 
um, because they that's a beautiful because images, that's a, yeah. yeah that's kind of part you know of what our our podcast is about is people um, bringing things like that up uh, which you know are always always on point and always uh, uh, um, appro- appropriate and applicable to what's being discussed. Um, I just wanted to go back a little bit because I know you're uh, really so well read, read and erudite and you went to seminary and there's a lot to cover. Did you did you want to uh, sort of take us from that, um, I guess, that church in the country and somehow, mm-hmm. I guess you going on to some other kinds of experiences or learning, I guess that would be in the 60s and 70s, right? If anything that it would, yeah, comes it to would mind. Be yeah. The, um, um, I graduated from high school in uh, 1969, so... Wow. Um, with everything going on today, uh, uh, you know, it was during those years from my, uh, the late fifties and on to, uh, or mid fifties through the success when the integration of, uh, public schools, mm-hmm. uh, and, um, gosh, in my little town of Granite Quarry, North Carolina, there was a, that's where the, uh, state, uh, Grand Dragon of the, North Carolina KKK lived, and uh, so yeah, it was all mixed up there with uh, uh, how a ble- how your uh, a, a congregation can bless you deeply and then be deeply flawed. So it was very much of a Southern um, Jim Crow kind of status quo kind of uh, mix all in there together. And really going off to college, I went to Wake Forest, and going off to college was uh, in rebellion uh, against that. Right. And uh, and uh, met uh, a, a person in literature and religion, Ralph Wood, who became a mentor That's right. since my uh, uh, graduation in 73. Wow. But yeah, it's just it's I wanted that to, mixture I, in our lives. I really the, wanted— The I, things that have blessed us and the things that have— yeah. uh, that are so flawed. Well, I, I, I putting that as flaws and glories and curses, all that aside, I, I'm glad you mentioned that man's name. Like I want, want you to mention him again and talk more about him because I, sometimes I think people that are really important sometimes get lost to history or people forget about what different people do. So who was this, this Mr. Woods or who talk a little bit about what he inspired in you and what, you know, and what a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Ralph Wood uh, is from East Texas. Yeah. In my junior year in college, I uh, was a religion major. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, was a religion major, and Ralph came, uh, just finished up his doctoral work at University of Chicago, and so his first year at Wake was my junior year. Okay. And his uh, emphasis was uh, religion and literature, so... Uh, read really, although I'd read in earlier English courses and even high school and college, but uh, uh, it the light came on in a way that it hadn't before, and and uh, you know with T. S. Eliot and George Herbert and oh, wow. uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins and yeah. uh, Gosh Flannery O'Connor, Walker Percy, the Southern those Southern writers. Yes. Um, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and the uh, yeah it was just uh, there, there's um, a, there's, that's really yeah, great to hear connected. It's great to hear you mention those names. I mean, I know I know love, love drew, drew me back. The uh, love babe babe. You remember that that poem? By, I'm sure you could probably recite that love by by Herbert. Uh, uh, love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew, drew back, back, guilty that's... of dust and sin. But quick eyed love, observing me grow slack. From my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioned me right. if I lacked anything. I love it. Uh, Ray Paul Williams' musical setting of that is one of my all is one of my very very favorite. Yeah. So so already you know you're mentioning a lot of things together that some people would keep separate. You're talking about Vaughn Williams and and Herbert and T. S. Eliot and Flannery O'Connor. That's very exciting. Um, as an aside, uh, what are your what's your favorite Flannery O'Connor? I mean, I, I like I like Wise Blood a lot and The Violent Bear It Away and um, Everything That Rises Must Converge. Is there any any um, 
She's well, there's in, a bunch of stories um, uh, in, in, you know, in uh, A Good Man is Hard to Find collection right. and Everything That Rises Must Converge. Uh, I, gosh, let's see. Revelation, that short story. Yeah. Um, Parker's Back. I mm. love that. Um, let's see. Um there's a, there's a lot Again, uh, yeah there's a lot there I mean I think the thing that strikes me about the names you mentioned um, and you may have some ideas about this as a men, as a, a, a pastor as well as well as I guess just a human being in the world is that there's a lot of similarities between those names you mentioned now when I think about Dostoevsky and and Flannery O'Connor and T S Eliot there of course there are differences in background and age and and all that but there, would you say that there's common Issues that they're that such writers are dealing dealing with, or or or, or, or kind of um... yes, oh yes, it is the ultimate things. I'm. Uh, it's is there anything as you're sitting, well, to, to bring it back home? Uh, yeah. Is there anything to it uh, to ultimate things as you're sitting by a nursing home bedside with a dying parent? Yeah, is wow. there, what's what's real and what isn't, and what. Um, truths what images again and again putting it in images rather than propositions and that's what's so good about the narrative writing of uh Dostoevsky or the you know brothers k let's say uh the dysfunctional families or the, the right. aliosha's or the patrosa i mean it's, it's, it's aliosha so, of course is from uh, uh brothers well, aliosha is from brother brothers karamazov right right, right. and yvonne right. and those those folks yeah yeah, um, and so there's yeah. the uh, yeah. What's what's ultimate? What what's below the um, the surface? Yeah, uh, furor. You know, so yeah, those writers, well, as great literature, they they are writing in that light. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you. You mentioned something interesting just now. Again, we'll get back to the biography, but these things kind of we go off on tangents. That's how you and I, when we get together, this is what. Jim, this is what happen, is going to happen. That's right. Um, That's right. You mentioned Im image, imagistic versus propositional. Now, I, I, I'm i asking you as someone who's certainly read the study of the Bible, well, well, first of all, what changed, if anything, in your theology at that time, and what do you make? You know, there's that scholar John Cars, right? Um, you know John, Jim Cars? I'm sorry, there's the one. Do you know Jim Cars? John Cars? I'm sorry, I don't. Yeah. His last name is oh C A R S E. He wrote a he wrote a strange little book called The Religious Case Against Belief. That doesn't really matter so much, but but the only reason why I mentioned him is um you remind you reminded me a little bit of him because it, his book is on the propositional versus the the um the the image yeah. and, and of course of course you know there's a there's a long history in uh, church history. Well, you you should probably talk much yeah. more about this than I do because, of course, there there are debates over you know, is religion primarily propositional? Is religion you know what is, right? What is an assertion and what you know all that? Without go, right. getting too much in the rabbit hole, I know that you were <laughs> you were awakened you were awakened to some of these discussions in the seventies, I guess, at that in that time, right? Yes, and and. Uh... Um, the uh, historical, critical, form critic, all the the uh, uh, those uh, methods of, of reading the sacred text. Yeah, that's that's important. The um, and then the um, textual criticisms. Again, I don't want to go down too far down to the rabbit hole, but 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 I guess let's put it this way. I heard uh, years ago um, someone say that. Uh, when the Western traditional Western mindset hears something uh, say in the, in the scriptures, they said, "Did that?" Uh, our, the first question is, "Did that really happen?" Yeah. Uh, and the Middle Eastern mindset, which is the out of which the um, uh, scriptures came, uh, or at least the uh, uh, Jewish scriptures and Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures, That's uh, is yeah. the the first question that comes to mind is. Of what is the truth of this story? So it is, um, uh, yeah, it is a, a that deeper question rather than um, because I guess. Oh, you that's know, so uh, really that's so interesting, Jim, because you're you're making a distinction where some 
some, you know, through no fault of their own, some less subtle leaders might not even observe that distinction. So go, that's why right. we should go back to that. So you're saying it's a, it's a difference between somebody saying, oh, did that really happen? Or someone saying, is that how that was? Or, you know, kind right. of a, or somebody, but the alternative you're saying is um, actually to start from the story or to start from what, what's there that you can use in your life, right? Is that it? Or what's, yeah. yeah. Well, I Talk mean, a little start bit from the story. In the beginning, right. God created the heavens and earth. Wow, well, you know, we'll talk about the beginning of a story. Yeah. And I guess I'm saying if um, the um, battle for the Bible, you know, that was a part of, of course, it's in every generation, I guess, but yeah. uh, in my generation and time as the ministry, it was... Uh, phrased in terms of inerrancy, uh, everything in the Bible is scientifically and historically true, quote unquote. Inerrant is the term for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, a lot of people still say, wait a minute, let me, I'm sorry. uh, If you say truth is described by scientifically and historically, that, and, and that's the, um, especially the scientifically part, because people use that and just that, that, um, already, I think, gives over the uh, the uh, that concedes what the scriptures, the deep parts of scriptures are saying, because that that's a that can be a secular understanding of what truth is, mm-hmm. uh, what is can be measured and defined and things like that. And truth is much mm-hmm. larger, much deeper than that. So you're, uh, you sounds to me, if I understand you correctly, and that's, thanks for putting it that way. Cause I think I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm getting grasping a little bit what you're saying. You're saying that, um, um, are you, so are you saying that there was this sort of mechanistic revolution, I, let's say in the 18th century and you're right. If that were part of that and you're, and mm-hmm. are you, are you saying that out of that came a strange phenomenon in which what we, I guess what some people call fundamentalists are actually, are actually, are are actually, so what it's, there's an irony. They're actually being too scientific or they're being right, even though they claim to be anti-science. Am I, so am I saying, am I get, is that kind of what it is that they're, you're saying they're ceding too much power to quantification and measurement and all that. Right. Things that you Which could just is measure. Irony, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's it's strange, but I guess this is a phenomenon going back centuries, and I think, but I, I guess you were, I guess you were figuring that out or coming to realize that in in in, in those years that we're that we're on now. Yeah. And I that guess sure the, the the, the yeah. question is, how does that influence? How did that influence your preaching or giving of sermons or 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 how? Well, I'm probably getting too far ahead, but go, but go c- continue because that's, um, yeah. Yeah, that was very, that's been uh, the the water I've been swimming in, you know, all, uh, uh, all my vocational life there is what, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, part of me, yeah, uh, I, I uh, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, the great illustration of uh, somebody asking Martha Gray of doing a dance, and uh, and somebody comes up to her afterwards and says, "Miss Graham, what did that dance mean?" And she said, <laughs> "Honey, if I could tell you what it means, I wouldn't have had to dance it." So yeah, there is right. just um, speaking in uh, ways and in, in parable and in, uh, mm-hmm. image that uh, to try to use words in a. a in the way that poetry speaks mm-hmm. rather than uh, proposition. That's right. And we're back I, to I that. I realized, proposition um, versus image. Yes. Yeah. We're back to that. Well, I realized uh, when an uh, engineer uh, in one of my congregations, uh, he came up uh, after a, after a, been there a while. He uh, was a nuclear, he, he taught uh, Jimmy Carter. Actually, he was. Oh, on, wow. Uh, this fellow was on uh, Admiral Rickover's staff, and yeah. so he trained Jimmy Carter on nuclear subs. And so he told, so he was an engineer, a uh, way, uh, a mindset, and he was 
as saying, I haven't understood a single sermon you've preached since you've been here and mm. realized that it was important for me to not just speak imagistically or uh, in that kind of way, but the linear, um, just be aware of the different kind of mindsets that were, that you were speaking, that I was speaking to. Huh. So I, I do you, I, I, I would guess not knowing fully that you identify with, with Jimmy Carter, right? in his approach to faith somewhat, or are you, do you feel he's a, he's a kindred, uh, kindred spirit? Yes. Yeah. Yes. In many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, an important group in my life, uh, from since the, 1980 has been a uh, a community called Jubilee Partners, okay, uh, which is a um, intentional community uh, that help that works. Uh, their their primary focus is uh, resettlement of refugees. So wow. refugees have come from all over the world, but that group came out of a group that lived near Jimmy Carter. Uh, that came out, it was called Koinonia, Clarence Jordan is a, a wonderful saint. It was an interracial community in the 1940s, and so wow. they were firebombed and everything mm -hmm. by that community there, Plains in America's Georgia. But Jimmy Carter's peanut, uh, far with it, they were the only ones in that area that did not boycott Koinonia. They mm -hmm. would. Uh, Jimmy Carter's dad would sell, you know, fertilize whatever they needed, while the other, uh, all the other uh, merchants of the town uh, were uh, trying to smother uh, Koinonia community out. So from that beginning back in the '40s, I think I've uh, been grateful for uh, Carter's. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he's still going. He and yeah, he's still doing it. Rosalind had their mask on and going to do an, another Habitat house here. If I, he's in his 90s. And yep. So, yeah, I, I, I'm very much uh, admiring. Absolutely. I mean, that's really, um, oh, there's so much to get to. Um, did you want to talk about some of your influences? I know that you like uh, a man named jo John Howard Yoder, and I know you like a man named Stanley Howross, I think. Um, that they were influences on you. Do you want to talk about them or do that later? Or I just have a lot of um, questions because I know that you, I guess what fascinates me is, is thinking about your first sermon that you gave, not when you were an assistant or, you know, they say a, a rookie or do you, do you remember, do you remember what year that was or what you, what you preached on or what Bible, what scripture you referred to? I mean, I'm just, cu just curious about what your first sermon or what that yeah. was. Gosh, Take me back I don't to know that. If I've that or not. No. I was, um, you know, I was, let's see, uh, I was a campus minister for about 13 years before uh, becoming a pastor. So That's I a was, long time. Even though my, the That's primary really, wow. focus most huh. of the time was on a university campus, I would preach occasionally um, in, in area congregations. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I did learn, uh, I thought, uh, well, how to tell this story here, about a prophet without honor in his own country. It, you usually think of that as a hostility on the hearer's part, but it can work another way, I realized. I remember preaching a sermon early on, thinking that I had shaken the foundations of Christendom or something and scalded everybody with prophetic uh, kind of, uh, denunciation. So, but then as people were leaving afterwards, my aunt walked by and said, Jimmy, that was just so sweet. Hmm. So, uh, th so things can come the other way. You know, if we can just uh, be, oh, isn't that cute? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> it's, funny that you're, it's funny that you, uh, that's uh, a funny that you remember that. It's so vividly, almost like it's this morning, right? That, it guess. was, yeah, because I was expecting, you know, a, a uh, I was trying to stir up artificially, so maybe engineer the kind of prophets' denunciations or something, but just see it, family, you know, family sees it and go, oh, isn't that sweet? Yeah. Well, they tried to, I guess, make it um, palatable or less, less, uh, I, I guess. Or well, maybe I was making a fool of myself, either one. I'm not sure. Probably a little of both. I don't know. I mean, do you identify yourself in part, I say only in part, as a prophetic Christian? 
because I know that Cornell West describes himself that way, and I don't really, I don't, I actually don't know what that would mean. But do you do you use that? Because you mentioned um, a prophet without honor, or with honor. I'm wondering if that connects to that at all, or, or not, or. Well, yeah, the prophetic tradition, the wisdom tradition. I mean, it is a part of, uh, very much a part of, um, the scriptures. Is part of of. Um, um, faith traditions, and that is one who uh, speaks over against, uh, you know, the, the phrase that's quoted a lot is uh, to afflict, I mean, to uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict, afflict the, the comfortable. comfortable. That's so right. The, mm -hmm. So the latter part would be the um, um, the prophetic part. And I, I yeah, I, I mentioned my background and growing up in the Jim Crow South and uh, the temptation or the even the yielding to the temptation of churches in those days, pastors in those days, was civil rights. Mm -hmm. That's politics, and that has no place in the church. When, when again, looking back on it, that's I think that's the most astounding uh, inbreaking of uh, the kingdom, God's kingdom of the clearest that, uh, that that happened in the, in our history. So, which, mm -hmm. so you have to, uh, yeah, you you have to say where is where is God at work, and 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 what was Amos, what was his message to uh, Israel? What was Jeremiah? What was Isaiah? What uh, mm -hmm. uh, what was John the Baptist who ended up you know beheaded? And, huh. yeah, and uh, was, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's that over against. Uh, Again, the phrase is used a lot, maybe overused, but it's true. Speaking truth to power, mm -hmm. uh, that's a part of um, a part of being faithful uh, mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, to what we're called to do. It sounds like you were, you were in the in the thick of that, very active, and I guess in so I guess it would, would have been civil rights movement you're discussing now, right? And and also against the Vietnam War too, because I know that. That you, um, I remember you saying this, a, a, an anti-Vietnam protest song. I think by um, it, c it could have been by um, I was going to say Utah Phillips, but my brain is getting um, yeah, and I'm, I can't remember. I just Phil, it may have been Phil uh, Oaks, Pete Seeger things, and uh, Phil, Phil, uh, Phil Oaks. I think it was you were saying Phil Oaks, but, but oh I, yes, uh -huh. that's right. But uh, yeah, so you, yeah, yeah, the, the music part of it, which is again the aesthetic part of how, how important um, it is to set uh, to set one's message to music because it is so um, not palatable it it, uh, it deepens and uh, it's easy people connect a melody with with that message and uh, yeah that the, the, the uh, well Dylan I mean you know with God on our side and uh, mm -hmm. masters of war just it's such a uh, well, gosh, from the beginning, uh, blowing in the wind, uh, all right. of the, you know. So yeah, well, if you, that's, if you... uh, a part of the prophetic part. Everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. If you, yeah, so if you were going to uh, talk to someone who is an outsider, doesn't know about some of these things, how would you describe, you know, the influence of the of Yoder and some of these other people? What would you, um, how would you further describe this part of Christian tradition or Christianity from then until now to, to someone who's not initiated? If you were, I don't know, if you were doing a, if you you were staying in front of a, a a a junior higher elementary school class, and I guess you know, as teacher said, you know, we have somebody here representing your faith. Uh, what it is to be a Christian in this context, or or why are you against war, or just anything that comes to mind. What would you, how would you describe it to someone that, um, if you had to, if you had to, had upon yourself to educate a novice or some you know somebody that's that's not um. Initiated. Yeah, and this is what would you um, just what would you say? I'm just curious. I'm, uh, yeah, this is uh, where I, I find myself 
uh, uh, over reliant upon uh, a manuscript or notes uh, mm-hmm. than uh, um, but uh, I, I guess I, I would say you know Yoder Powerwas uh, is influenced uh, well Yoder from this tradition the Mennonite tradition okay. and of, of uh, um, a pacifist tradition um, that uh, the um, what do you call it? The Anabaptist vision of a, a small community that was never in charge. You don't, in terms of the all the the uh, uh, offices and the uh, positions of power in a society, but it was the uh, um, small disciplined group uh, of, yeah. uh, of believers in a that sense of of, um, of of the way church takes place, the way the communities of faith takes place. So it is uh, again a minority of you from the margin. Uh, rather than now when you in, uh, wait, hold on more Christendom kind of thing of let's get our folks in the power and we'll run things and we'll make things come out right. I, I just wanted to ask you a question because you said it was mar- marginal or minority. I guess you also mean demographically, statistically, right? Do you mean that as well, or do you, or in other words, in terms of it's, it's not a large, it's not a um, yeah statistically yeah. yeah. In fact, I, 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 I can't remember the specific, but um, Catholic um, Archbishop who said this, but of saying, um, and this was several years ago, a number of years ago, about from here on out, or at least in Christianity, there will be a, a minority uh, perspective, which, uh, and and that's that's true. I think when we as we can see, we're going to try to be the ones running the show politically, militarily, mm. economic. You know, we, it's things get distorted. So it's it's mm. that sense of uh, um, more the more from the margin, from 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 a life of its own that's not trying to uh, um, run everything else. Mm. But still, still very much a part of it. Not not a kind of withdrawal from life or whatever. That's right. But it's not. It's a different kind of uh, different kind of power, different kind of wisdom at work. So, so it's basically um, being consistent and having integrity and committing to this vision, but but not doing so that you you shun the world, but actually you in, you engage in debates of the day and you're involved in right. You're it seems like you're involved in the larger town square about whatever may come up or what, what we know that's very much yeah you know, yes. that's 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 um that's a, a that's very helpful in my understanding you know a couple of people that come to mind i'm wondering what your impressions of them are what do you think of the berrigans dan daniel and philip berrigan um, yeah they, uh, what they do you, were uh prophets uh flesh and blood um doing uh sometimes what um many would look at and call outrageous acts I mean, uh, but it was like a jeremiah that would run unclothed through the streets with a yoke on his neck i mean it was those kind of prophetic embodied acts that would say what you know what you know and and uh so the uh Cain, Cainville nine, Cainsville nine yeah, yeah it was they were they were very much uh and and talk about uh, a poet reading uh, Daniel Berrigan's commentaries on the prophets, on the Hebrew prophets of uh, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, and then the Book of Daniel. Uh, he uh, paraphrases and uh, speaks in those uses uh, those texts, sacred texts, as a launching place and then writes about them poetically and so mm-hmm. yes that, that's a wonderful uh blessed be his memory he is he uh lived life faithfully and uh not uh placidly at all he, his was a uh um uh the uh an uproarious kind of life uh mm-hmm. or upheaval kind of life which is uh Sometimes the way the faithful life is. I saw a photo, by the way, uh, 
not too long ago of the throng that attended his funeral. I mean, this was, mm -hmm. was like multiple blocks of yep. people in the processional uh, to the um, to the uh, cathedral or to the church uh, oh, yeah. building where his uh, funeral was, and it was such a striking kind of uh, reminder of the influence that he. Oh yeah, and he was on the run a lot of times. You know, I know William. He was he was actually a right. Well, he's a political fugitive at times. It's oh, it's yeah. it's interesting yeah. because I when I was very young, I think age thirteen and fourteen. I came across a book called Outrageous Acts by by Daniel Berrigan. Do you remember that book? It was um, uh, it was a paperback book, and in it, one of the things that struck me about that book is the in the beginning of that paperback there was, a, there was an open letter to the weatherman of all people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have not read it. I have oh, it's heard amazing. It referred to, but uh, yeah, how it's old were you when you read that? I guess I was 13, but but the thing about this letter is he's basically castigating the weatherman, saying that you know you're not, you know you're 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 being destructive and violence isn't isn't basically telling him that violence is not the way and destruction of human life. But it's it's I just remember you know as someone very young, not not really knowing much about either, and not really, I didn't really even know, you know. Of course, you 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 and your generation, of course, very much know about the weatherman in that period and have a very firm memory of it i guess i guess what struck me about it was odd odd for a catholic catholic priest to you know engage in issues like that i mean i guess at that time but um yeah and then uh and then the the destruction then of of uh draft records yeah putting them with napalm or that's Cat cattonsville nine yeah, yeah. Them. and yeah. so it's that um Maybe he was saying about the destruction of human life, mm -hmm. speaking against it. But uh, then this act of, um, say, and that's that was a charge of you know, destruction of property or you yeah. know, things like that. But there was, uh, he felt the call of that prophetic act in in that um, in that setting. It's fascinating. I mean, again, for an audience member who's who's not a person of faith or a Christian. What are some other traditions in Christianity that that you're what you feel is you are critical of or in rebellion with? I mean, it, it's it, what I'm saying is that this is a, a, one of the oldest religions, and it's um, it seems like it has a lot of rooms in it. It's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty large. A lot of people have misconceptions about I think Christian Christianity itself. I think I think in part because there's so many denominations, and you know, there's the Protestant tradition, there's the Catholic tradition. Right, and then there's there's Orthodox, which is a whole other, you know, uh, third and and um, Eastern, and and um, if somebody, you know, again, an, 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 someone that listening audience who's not an expert on any of that doesn't know, what would you, how would you describe the the landscape of of your faith? How you've described your your um, what are, what are the different? Because it could be kind of confusing if you're not if you're not um, you know, if you're not up on every uh, on everything. Right, it mind. can be, and that's. Um, I think that the importance of uh, finding ways in. In fact, one of George Herbert's poems, and he was a wonderful poet of, of uh, the 1600s. Uh, uh, I've got to tell one of his stories. He would write poetry as a pastor uh -huh. uh, at Bemerton in uh, uh, in England, but uh, so but he never published or anything like that. So on his deathbed, he told a friend that he these poets he's written these poems through the years, and for the friend to look at them, and if he thought um, I think it was Isaac Walton, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, mm -hmm. he told his friend if you think these are can be useful, you can. Pass along, of course. Say, he's one of the most wonderful devotional poets of the whole of our the whole tradition. That's but right. the, that kind of humility of um, I've put these over here, and if you think they're worthy, you know, can pass them along. We're still reading them four hundred years later. That's right. Um, but so it's uh, anyway. One of Herbert's pictures is uh, you walk into a cathedral uh, uh and uh it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside so that's mm. I, I love that image of seems like real constricting or this particular religious tradition or whatever but you walk inside it and it's so much bigger 
on the inside than it looks to be on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, um, you know, in the Orthodox tradition, the Eastern Orthodox, there was a split in 1054 wow. uh, in East and West mm -hmm. Christendom. And uh, uh, later in life, I've been learning more about the Orthodox tradition, which is, a, uh, it, I'll see it as, uh, looking at different traditions is uh, holding the diamond and turning it and getting a different facet uh, a facet of it and and mm -hmm. so um, that whole tradition is so uh, deep and uh, as a uh, well the whole Catholic tradition uh, mm -hmm. Stanley Hirewas taught at Notre Dame for many years he did and, that's uh, right he taught at a Catholic uh, university right? yeah oh, so he grew up as a Texas bricklayer <laughs> the United right. Methodist Church and then went wow. to Yale and then taught at a Lutheran college Augustana and then went to um, and taught for many years at Notre Dame mm -hmm. and um, uh, so that, that the Catholic tradition uh, yeah. got one story uh, while at Wingate University I was a campus minister there but was able to take a group of students to Rome uh, and we've made In arrangements uh, through uh, it wow. was uh, through the um, uh, ecumenical institute that Wake Forest had with Belmont Abbey. So they hooked okay. us up with some Catholic sisters wow. in Rome, Foyer Unitas, whose calling was to provide hospitality to non-Catholic visitors hmm. to Rome. So yeah. Sister Galama gave us a two or three hour lecture on the art in the Sistine Chapel wow. uh, before we went and then got us tickets to, um, uh, to, to the Pope John Paul's first um, um, audience there in 1985 and got us on the court uh, on the um, aisle so uh pope john came by and spoke with us and wow and then we went to a pontifical mass at saint peter's on epiphany sunday and um and in that uh service it was a consecration of archbishops the whole mass was in latin mm -hmm. and i'd seen that as a Rural North Carolina uh, Protestant, as Latin was just a way to keep the masses uh, in ignorance, so the priests could do their dirty work or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it struck me in that service of of how people from around the world, literally, it seemed like every nation on earth, Latin was the language mm -hmm. in which each of them could be a part of that service and participate fully. And it's, uh, it just struck me as, you know, Catholic, you know, little c, Catholic is universal. So it's this, this of what is it that we share in our faith with people all around the world? It really was a, a light bulb kind of moment. Oh, and that's, that's what that means rather than, uh, uh, the kind of, uh, negative, suspicious kind of, uh, yeah. attitude I've had before. So, so you're talking about an actual change in your consciousness. In other words, growing up in a very, I guess it was an isolated community because it was Protestant and rural. And I guess you were kept away from information about Catholicism, or at least the information yeah. you had was prejudicial, right? It was sort of, was almost anti-Catholic and in, in, in kind of a, in a bigoted way, maybe. I don't know, but would uh, that be fair? Some or, of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, some of that, although it was... Um, I mean, gosh, um, it, uh, it, and then so was, that's just who all that lived there. I mean, we didn't mm -hmm. know. Uh, it, it was a very home, more of a homogeneous kind of uh, uh, demographic than right. uh, what. So, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, I think that was more part of it then. But there was, yeah, there was that, uh, definitely that kind of uh, anti-Catholicism anti that they weren't like us or all those, they worship Mary or they do yeah. this or they do that, they do statues and <laughs> all those kind of things. Well, but, it's uh, funny because I, mean, you, 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 I guess you had an internal change. And I, I'm wondering, did part of that change have, it, have to do with the beauty of the Latin length, the Latin itself? Like, did you just start to see, oh, I see the, what this is, this language, and did it open up? I guess it opened something up in you, right? And you, you kind of look. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, I, and I took Latin in high school, so. Oh, okay. Um, and then seminary studies of, yeah, just the breadth and, yeah. and uh, 
the width of, of the tradition as you start to learn um, of it being a world religion. You know, you're over, so you're so fortunate. Centuries. You're so fortunate. You got to study Latin. I neither study Latin nor Greek. If I could have a time machine and go back, I would do do a total classical education like that and study study those. I never, I never. But you did that, right? You did study Latin in high it school. Was, and, well, I, yeah. I share uh, some of your regret of, of being such a sorry student, you know, just taking it because, you know, I, I wish I would have been uh, um, a better student of languages. I mean, and we were told uh, multiple times by seminary professors, if you'll just work with the text 15 minutes a day mm-hmm. uh, after you upon graduation, just 15 minutes, just keep your... Uh, uh, Greek reading skills, um, and you know, of course, especially since I was going in, I wasn't preaching upon graduation. Of, uh, I wasn't. I didn't become a pastor until 15 years after I graduated. I was yeah. getting campus ministry, so I did not do that, and deeply regret that losing that. Uh, where it becomes, you become fluent in the in the reading of it. That's another whole story, by the way, Mitch. Of uh, well, I'd love to hear it. Who have been, been then trained in classical Greek, yeah, and then go to Koine Greek, which huh. is the every, everydayness, and uh, uh, are struck by how wow uh, how the language is um, so much less uh, so yeah much less grander, or how classical Greek is just soaring mm-hmm. and uh and uh like a poet's convention i guess or whatever but yeah. uh and then koine greek new testament greek is, is in the in the common language uh of the marketplace and uh um yeah. so, I mean, just what all that means you know about trying to get the messages across mm-hmm. not in some whatever removed language from daily life but somehow instilling our daily discourse with um, something other than just grab information. Mm. That's um, yeah, that's a uh, there's a lot there. We <laughs> could probably go deep <laughs> deeper if we wanted to. I wanted to I wanted to ask you another question more about the present time because I know that you've been active in this 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 prison. And I know that you told me a story that just knocked me out, knocked knocked me out about the art program there and something about restrictions and materials. Do you mind telling that telling the uh, uh, listeners that story that um, about what one of the inmates was doing or or I don't know. Do you remember what I'm, what I'm asking um, about? Vaguely, I, I think the. Um... I must, and I'm trying to remember, Mitch. I, 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 I looked. I was looking at, at some art that actually a couple of uh, uh, inmates, uh, offenders, had done, and mm-hmm. thought it was painting. You know, uh, uh, and it turned out that um, brushes, uh, oil paints, or whatever, are not allowed. That this was done with colored pencils. And so they're, uh, yeah, it's so amazing of um, what they were able to do uh, with very um, limited supplies. And I may have given you, I know a friend gave me a, uh, a knitted angel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is by a man who's been on death row. In, yes, um, this is the. I think this in, is one. Is that the one? Yeah, because you said it oh, involved uh, maintenance equipment or some kind of a bro- a broom. Yeah. Or so this, when yeah, he tell- went in, he was able to have knitting needles, and he learned. I mean, this is uh, he he learned how to uh, knit, uh, and so he would have uh, the uh, yarn and the and the needles and learned how to knit, and so he knitted this friend a picture of Da Vinci's, um, or, a, a, yeah, a knitted the, the Last Supper by wow. Leonardo Da Vinci. So it was that kind of uh, skill. But he took to um, knitting little angels, just 
very, very small angels and would give them to the friend uh, to say, give these to somebody who needs a blessing out there. And um, so a new superintendent came to the prison and said there will be no more yarn or no more needles. Mm. Um, and so this person was, the, this inmate was the um, custodian. So he to broom, you know, he had access to a broom, so he would take broom straws, straws mm-hmm. off the broom, uh, and then a he would have uh, a towels, and when the lights went out, you know, he would take the strings off the towels, mm-hmm. and he was still, still uh, making these uh, angels, and and this friend gave me one. Uh, so this is. Uh, you might need a blessing today and then told the story behind it. But the, uh, yeah, the resolve and the creativity of, of how to um, make, uh, to express that artistic uh, gift within you. I mean, that story is what, what our podcast is about right there. I can, I can tell you that I'd love to get in touch with him and have him on the show. I don't know if that's possible or not, but, but, um, uh, I think he he is still in, uh, and he's in another state. Um, mm. He is still in in very very poor health, oh. uh, and uh, we were hoping for a compassionate release, mm. uh, but as of yet, that has not taken place. Mm. So we're still hoping and praying yeah. that that will happen. Well, who knows? I mean, you know, through long distance technology, we certainly don't have to be in the same cell or the same, you know, the the, the same room if, if if you know if they're communicating. But that's you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, I've, yeah, there are some procedural kind of difficulties with that, uh, Mitch. With the, uh, oh, I mean, sure. you have to be the only calls can be those on your family list or your yeah, invitation list yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that's, but, um, um, I always tell when I have a chance. Remember the prisoner. Uh, part of the COVID there is that they have had no family visitations since uh, the middle of March. Wow. So they don't have uh, the weekly family. There are no religious services of any kind um, mm-hmm. because we can't have more than uh, you know about eight or nine gathered together, um, and so it's all of an individual kind of. Mm conversation yeah. and and uh so it's difficult there as well as as it is here so the new testament there's a couple of verses in there says remember the prisoners so i'll pass mm-hmm. that along i'm glad you i'm glad you mentioned that in this in this episode um uh it, it occurs to me jim we're getting i guess cl- closer towards the end of uh this podcast episode i always hate saying goodbye to people but as you know, good, goodbye is one of those inevitable things. Um, that's right. And um, is and there a, it means God be with you, actually. So that's a, a good a good blessing. <laughs> it, it is. But before we say that, before we even say even God be with you, is all that's very appropriate for this episode. Is there anything that you want to say aside from, of course, discussing prisoners' rights and, and, and the virus and, and um, uh, that's important. But is there any, anything else that comes into your mind about anything? that you would like to uh, leave the listener with or impart to them or of your, of all your many years of wisdom and, 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 and your faith and practice and just whatever comes up into your consciousness. Um, yeah. Well, I uh, will um, just happen to have this little book in front of me here. Um, and in terms of what is going on um uh, in our land and in our world right now, uh, mm-hmm. this man by the name of Charles Marsh, and I, I just keep this really close because this is important, especially as a white Christian. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, Marsh said this, it occurred to me several years ago that if you are a Southerner, white, and Christian, and I am all of those, you owe the credibility of your faith to the courage and conviction of your black brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Without their witness, your own religious claims ring hollow. Without their sacrifices, your piety becomes self-referential and shrill. And without their devotion, your pursuit of holiness lacks the scrutiny of historical contrast that prepares the way for repentance and revival. So I, I, I guess would encourage 
um, us as, as uh, white folk, especially white church folk, to um, understand that our expressions become shrill and self-referential without that kind of hard, uh, historical context mm -hmm. that the African-American black church gospel mm. um, can give to us. Um, so, and that's speaking to a church crowd, but I think that's uh, uh, such a crucial um, crucial understanding to have uh, as we try to navigate uh, these uh, blessed and broken days. Blessed and broken days. Well, Jim McCoy, thank, thanks for that, um, that, those words in the conclusion. It's really, um, it's been really great having you on the show. And I want to, th I want to thank you for the time to do it. Cause I know everybody's, bu they're busy, even given the virus and everything. There's a lot people got going on and, and, um, it's great. It was great uh, to ha have you spend this hour with us and, and talk about these matters. These all, I guess these ultimate matters is what I would call them. Um, yeah. Well, I want to say what a, uh, what a joy your friendship is, Mitch, and how I admire, uh, your musical gifts. But then also uh, how alive you bring folks of listening to your podcast and how alive mm. uh, you as interviewer bring mm. folk and make, make those conversations available. So thank you, friend. Thank you, Jim. All right. Goodbye. Take care. Bye. -bye. I don't like goodbyes, so I'll see you soon, folks. Thank you.